We'd like to uh, start with the second uh, session of uh, today's uh, program. And this uh, session, our uh, panel is uh, concerned with the diaspora politics and foreign policy, the case of Israel. We have somewhat uh, changed the nature of this uh, session, and there will be no formal uh, discussion. And therefore, each uh, presenter will have uh, approximately 25 uh, minutes, and uh, uh, thereafter we'll uh, open the floor for questions and uh, discussion. We'll take the uh, presenters uh, in the same order as they appear in the program, and we hope that uh, Professor Shane will uh, join us uh, shortly. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Professor uh, Gabriel Schaeffer, Professor Emeritus from the Department of Political Science here from Hebrew uh, University. Professor Schaeffer is one of the uh, leading uh, scholars today in the world in uh, diaspora uh, studies. I think that I will not uh, exaggerate if I say that one uh, cannot uh, write today on uh, transnationalism and uh, diasporism without uh, referring to the uh, scientific uh, corpus, uh, both the theoretical and the empirical that uh, Professor uh, Schaeffer has uh, contributed uh, to the field among his uh, most recent uh, books, uh, our, uh, Diaspora Politics at Home Abroad from 2003 by uh, Cambridge University Press, and uh, Who Leads Israeli Diaspora Relations from 2006 by uh, the Kibbutz uh, Meuchad. And uh, Professor uh, Schaeffer will uh, talk today on Israel, the Jewish diaspora, and foreign policy in a comparative perspective. Please. Well, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Uzi, for your uh, introduction. Now, there is no question that in certain respects, the Jewish diaspora is an established ethno-national religious diaspora that has uh, its own unique uh, characteristics. There is no question about this. These uh, characteristics include, for example, the diaspora's very long historical existence, the exiles and uh, pogroms that uh, its members uh, experience, the Holocaust, and on the other hand, its capacity to survive and its cultural contributions. However, in many other respects, it has similar characteristics to many other established diasporas. For example, uh, to the Indian, to the Chinese, Japanese, Italian, Armenian, and Greek diasporas. These are all old diasporas. They, they are not new or they are not in, incipient uh, diaspora, and they have many similarities. Among other things, uh, such similar characteristics in, include the diasporas in identity that is based on a combination of primordial, psychological, and instrumental elements. The maintenance of the diaspora historical culture, the role of uh, historical memories, the contact with the country of origin, country of origin of the diaspora, okay? Of uh, the diaspora as a, as a general phenomenon, the maintenance of the diasporic boundaries, namely each of the diasporas try to uh, maintain and keep the boundaries of uh, its, its members, especially of uh, its core member, the patrons of organization, the organizations, and so on and so forth. So these are some of the uh, elements that uh, we can say uh, characterize the Jewish diaspora and other uh, diaspora. Both the unique and the similar basic characteristics have impacts on most uh, diasporas in general, and particularly on the Jewish diaspora uh, interest and involvement in foreign relations and policies of their countries of origin, including uh, Israel. And I'm going to focus on this uh, aspect. Just to, to demonstrate uh, this point, many of the core members, that is not the assimilated or the fully integrated people into uh, their countries of residence have strong connections with their countries of origin, including their foreign relations and policies. <coughs> like other established diaspora, the Jewish diaspora has impressive human and financial resources. And it is well organized, which facilitates its involvement uh, in their countries of origin, internal and foreign 
uh, uh, politics. Actually, the Jewish diasporic organizations are active in many spheres, including, of course, in the sphere of their relations uh, with their countries of residence, with other Jewish uh, communities in other countries of residence, and of course with Israel. Again, among other things, the diasporic organizations, including the Jewish ones, deal with various aspects of foreign affairs of their countries of uh, residence, with other countries of residence, of their kin, and with their country of origin. Uh, in the Jewish case, uh, it, it is, of course, uh, Israel. Recently, all these contacts, involvements, and attempts at influencing foreign policies and relations have become easier due to a number of uh, uh, factors, to the relatively uncomplicated migration, the easiness of uh, migration, the easiness of transportation, and recent uh, developments of uh, the sophisticated communication system. These factors help, of course, to keep very close, intimate, secretive, and public contact with the country of the diaspora's um, the contact with the countries of origin, including, of course, uh, with Israel in the Jewish uh, diasporic uh, case. Again, like the situation of other established diasporas, the core persons of uh, the Jewish, the core persons are, again, are those who are not uh, assimilated or fully integrated in their uh, uh, countries of uh, uh, residence. So the Jewish diaspora are becoming interested not only in the foreign policies of their countries of residence and of Israel, but they are also becoming more interested and involved in various aspects of the general international situation, such as world war, worldwide terrorism, racism, and, and economics. I'm writing now, I've uh, finished to write uh, 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 an article about uh, this issue, which is in, fa in fact the first article on the issue of the involvement of diasporas on the international level, on the international level, not necessarily with their countries of residence and uh, of countries uh, of, uh, of origin, the countries of origin. And this is a growing kind of uh, development. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the interest of the diasporas in these uh, issues. And there are, there are activities in uh, uh, various, uh, uh, various organizations like the uh, United Nations and, and so on and so, uh, so forth. Now what I'm going to say about certain aspects of the Jewish diaspora involvement in Israeli foreign uh, relations and policies applies also to other diasporas. I'm just reminding you my, my main point. Following are some, not all, relevant issues. First, since, uh, 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 since like uh, most of uh, the other diasporas, the Jewish diaspora is a heterogeneous uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, its religious and communal backgrounds, ideological attitudes, actual patterns of behavior, etc. It has no one interest and position concerning foreign relations and foreign politics of Israel and uh, in the uh, diaspora's countries of uh, origin. This is a very, a very important point. Many people tend to forget about it, and they put the entire diaspora in, into one basket, and they generalize. This is wrong. We should not generalize in regard to the diaspora. Diasporas like uh, homelands are heterogeneous, and we should take it into account when we are discussing uh, all this issue. In this connection, one of the main issues that is more intensively and critically debated within the diaspora and with Israel is the issue of the peace process with the Palestinians and other Arab uh, countries. This is the main issue in which uh, you have the, the impact of heterogeneity. There is no one single uh, attitude in, in reg uh, regarding the, uh, the, 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 the policies that Israel is, uh, uh, is pers pursuing. Uh, 
such, uh, such a kind of debates about uh, the solution or management of intrastate or interstate acute conflicts apply also, for example, to the Iranian, Turkish, and Palestinian diasporas. There are great similarities in this, uh, in this regard. The, the heterogeneity and the uh, different uh, the divisions and the different attitudes of uh, the diaspora, and this is the, uh, the situation in, uh, uh, in regard to many other diaspora. In the Jewish case, the emergence of J Street and other similar movements and organizations is demonstrating it's, uh, the growing debates and lack of agreement among diverse groups in the heterogeneous diaspora about Israeli government uh, policies. Many Jews, like Israel, and the, the core, mostly the core people, the, the main group of uh, those who maintain their uh, identity and their contacts, they like Israel. <coughs> But otherwise, we should, uh, uh, we should uh, realize that there are growing disagreements within the diaspora about Israel's, Israeli government policies and politics uh, in, many, in many respects. And uh, it should, in this connection, it should uh, also be noted that among the religious part of uh, the Jewish diaspora, especially the reform and conservative movements, there are growing criticism of uh, the Israeli lack of movement toward the management and solution of the Palestinian, of the Palestinian issue as a, as a foreign uh, policy. I was, uh, uh, I was teaching uh, for a year at Duke University, and I, um, I came to be connected very closely, to be connected uh, uh, as a result of their invitation to the reform uh, community in uh, uh, there, which is a large reform co community. And this is an anti-government um, community. They are critical, so critical. And they are not part of uh, J Street. Let me remind you also that uh, J Street is not the only uh, organization in Canada, you have many, and including in, the, in Europe, you have many organizations that uh, uh, are dealing with this issue. These internal debates among uh, the Jewish diasporans are reflected in various organizations' lobbying efforts concerning Israeli position in various uh, countries of residence, and especially in the United, United States. J Street, for instance, started to lobby in the administration and in the, uh, in the um, Congress to uh, promote their, uh, their policy, their uh, position. Although APAC maintains and even increases the number of its uh, member, the opposing organization gain also more support in the diaspora. It must be ad added that APAC and other Jewish organizations uh, traditional organization, historical organization, have lost some of their ability to influence the actual policies of the United States. This is the case since actually the Israeli government is less involving APAC in its attempt uh, to influence the United States uh, foreign policy concerning, for example, the Israeli and Palestinian, uh, Palestinian conflict. In fact, since the days of uh, the late uh, Prime Minister Rabin, uh, Israel is uh, contacting the White House directly, except when the relations between the Israeli government and the US administration are problematic, like, the case, uh, like in the case of Netanyahu's government and Obama's administration. Then the, the Israeli uh, politician will try to do something through AIPAC but mainly the contacts are directly with the administration, and APAC has lost a lot of its uh, uh, impact and its role in forming a foreign relation. Let me add here a general observation examining the Jewish case and other diasporic cases. Uh, it is pretty clear that the impact of diasporas, especially on their countries of origins, uh, foreign and international is pretty limited. The Jewish diaspora has very limited in influence 
on Israel's foreign poli policies. Though they try to get involved, they try to say certain things, but in fact, the Israeli government uh, is, uh, is not impressed by, the, by what the, the, the people in the diaspora are, are saying about it, neither from the left nor from the uh, right. Yet another aspect that influences the relevant sphere of foreign politics is that uh, the Israeli government and many other countries of origin have established special ministries for dealing with uh, the diaspora. Next week, there is going to be a huge uh, uh, conference here uh, by, by, by the joint in which uh, many uh, you know, uh, ministers, many officials from many countries are coming to listen and to hear what's going on in, in this respect. And uh, this is a, a growing phenomenon. Um, you have, uh, you know, uh, in most countries that have, have a diaspora, quote unquote, have a diaspora, you have now a ministry, a ministry that uh, um, dealing with this, uh, with this issue. Uh, through these ministries, the Israeli government, uh, through the, the ministry uh, and, uh, and other uh, um, the, uh, countries of uh, origin, try to attack, attract sorry, the attention and support of more Jewish diasporans for closer relations with Israel and advancing Israeli international political and economic interests. Israel, as well as other countries of origin, try their utmost, especially when their relations with the diaspora uh, countries of, uh, of uh, residents are in reasonable shape, to assist the diaspora communities when they face difficulties, clashes, terrorism, and threats in such uh, countries of residence. And let me emphasize the fact that uh, they are doing it on they can do it uh, relatively effectively when the relationship between the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, country of origin and the country of, of resident uh, are good, when uh, these relations are not, uh, um, uh, when this relationship are uh, problematic, then the influence uh, and the ability of uh, the uh, of Israel to help the diaspora is uh, pretty limited. See, for example, the Israeli government activities in the cases of the Jewish Soviet Union and Eastern European diaspora before the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, uh, and the, the cases of uh, the attacks on the Argentinian and French Jews. On the other hand, Israel and other countries of origin face quite severe uh, problems and difficulties in their relations with their diasporas, uh, countries of uh, residence, government, and society concerning the increasing diaspora criminal, drug trafficking, unauthorized economic activities, especially Ill illegal investments and uh, transfers of money. This is becoming also a major issue regarding diaspora, and not only the uh, uh, not only the Mexican diaspora, but also the is the Jewish diaspora. The Jewish diaspora is involved in very uh, in a various um, uh, aspect of criminal activities, drug trafficking, unauthorized economic activities, and, um, and so on, which I mentioned a, mi a minute ago. In these cases, Israel and other countries of origin face severe dilemmas. Whom should they support? The diaspora or the country of, or, uh, of uh, residence? And once again, this is connected to the relationship between Israel and the uh, countries uh, of uh, residence. The growing potential and actual interest, involvement activities of diasporans on the international level and in regard to the international organizations such as the United Nations and the European uh, create additional foreign policy uh, dilemmas for Israel and for other countries of origin in the cases of other diaspora. In this respect, one set of questions is to what extent Israel and the other countries of origin should coordinate, encourage, and support such activities of their diasporas vis-a-vis 
such international organizations. In conclusion, it is clear that the spheres of foreign relation is complex and has many aspects. I've dealt only with some major issues, but not with all of the relevant uh, issues. Let me add a few general observations, first from the analytical uh, point of view. Since the Jewish diaspora and its uh, connection to Israel, foreign relations and, and policies is not unique, we can have interesting insights when we compare the Jewish and other diaspora in this area of political and uh, foreign relations and activities. Namely, we should uh, take the, the Jewish and Israeli case, compare it to other diasporas, and take other diasporas and compare uh, them to, uh, the Israeli, uh, to the Jewish and Israeli case. Then, since foreign policy and relations between the country of origin and its, its diaspora, quote unquote, has many fronts and, uh, and aspects, one should deal with them when examining or discussing uh, these, uh, these matters. Among the main aspects that should be analyzed are, first, the impacts of the different situation and foreign politics in various countries of residence, of the diaspora in uh, various countries of residence. Second, the heterogeneity, as I mentioned before, the heterogeneity of the diaspora and hence uh, the various attitudes and activities of various diasporic groups. We should make distinction and pay attention, as I mentioned before. Three, the type and activities of diasporic organizations. Uh, once again, uh, this is a very important uh, aspect. Uh, fourth, the relevant resources a diaspora has and its ability to use them. Fifth, the relations between the countries of origin and the countries of uh, residence, six and six, the flexibility and contacts between a diaspora and the relevant governmental offices in the uh, hostland and homeland. In order to reach some theoretical conclusions, all these issues should be discussed in a, com a comparative matter manner, as I said uh, before. In this connection, one of the most important theoretical aspects is that the analytical findings should uh, contribute to further distinction between ethno-national religious diasporas, like the Jewish diaspora, this is my definition and many other people's definition of the diaspora, that are connected to specific countries of origin on the one hand, and on the other hand, the pure ideological and religious dispersal that are uh, composed of both permanent uh, citizens in their countries of origin and of migrants of different ethno-national religious origins. And finally, further comprehensive analytical comparative findings should uh, contribute to our understanding of the impacts of current worldwide processes on the continued existence of diasporas, on their ability to persist on their ability to solve the problem facing them and their countries of origin in this rapidly changing world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Schaeffer, for this uh, insightful uh, presentation. The second uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Onatan Aoudan from uh, Ben Gurion University of the Negev. Uh, Dr. Awidan's uh, major uh, areas of uh, research is uh, Israel diaspora uh, relations, Israeli diplomacy and foreign policy, and Anglo Israel uh, relations. Dr. Awidan uh, serves as the managing uh, editor of the TWI uh, annual Israel studies, which is uh, published by uh, Indiana University Press. And the title uh, of his uh, presentation today is uh, working out the relationship Israel and its advocates converging and diverging paths from AZ PAC to J Street. Please. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here and um, to explain um, that my research has benefited, first of all, when I was a doctoral student here at the University when Mohon Davis gave me a grant to buy books, which are still on my shelf, 
and I use them and it was very, very helpful. And I've also benefited from my research, comparative research from the research of, of Gabi Sheffer here and Uzi Rebhan and Alan Doughty. Now, one of the things that I always do when I lecture is I deal with what I'm not going to deal with. I'm not going to give a detailed history of APAC or in fact, the lobby, which I'm writing a book about, but I want to give some sort of historical background. And I think we're living in an age and an era that there is no such thing 100% as someone who is 100% a historian or only someone 100% in terms of uh, international relations. We're living in an area that you cannot write history without being influenced by research in international relations, models, sociology, etc., and of course the opposite. And this paper is part of my comprehensive research on all aspects of the relationship between Israel's di diplomatic legations and diaspora Jewish communities in English-speaking countries um, until uh, the 1970s, 1973. I've written three and a half chapters and I'm finishing off the last, and we always, we always know that the last chapters are the hardest. I've had the privilege of being granted access to Abi Iban's private archive, the first to do so, at the gracious discretion of the late Suzy Iban, whom may she be a blessed memory, with whom I cooperated and encouraged and helped her write her memoirs. And also the first to have access to APAC's archive in Washington, DC. I wish to focus on the complexities of establishing the Israel lobby. And notice it is the Israel lobby, it's not the Israeli lobby. There is no such thing as a Jewish lobby. People write about the Jewish lobby. There is no such thing as a Jewish lobby or the Jewish lobby, or in fact, the Israeli lobby. And what I will do is to explain attempts to establish competing lobbies which were shunned by respective Israeli governments. I demonstrate that Israel's policies towards pro-Israel advocates has been consistent from the beginning and goes much towards explaining successive governments. Although Ambassador Michael Oren finally consented to meet with J Street leaders, and by the way, I'm not quite sure if you're aware of this, why it's called J Street, and that is in Washington, there is no J Street. All the streets are named after letters, but the architect who designed Washington hated the first, um, the first governor of Washington who began with a J. So he missed out J, so anyone who wants to go to find J Street, you won't find it because it doesn't exist. But of course, K Street is where most of the lobbies are situated. So having J Street, it wasn't so Jewish, but it was putting the point that somewhere that de doesn't exist. So if someone tells me to meet in Washington between K Street and L Street, I know there's no problem. Um, now, although Mike Lauren met with J Street in private, he regarded J Street as a unique problem in that it not only opposes one policy of Israeli government, it opposes all policies of all Israeli governments. Although Deputy Ambassador Baruch Bina attended Israel, uh, J Street's recent annual conference only this year, but his address couched in diplomatic language was a comeuppance and a ringing indictment of J Street's agenda. <laughs> I don't think he'll be invited next year. Israel has consistently refused to endorse pro-Israel organizations considered either ineffective or refused to be instructed by its representatives. Israel aimed to diminish the competition. Thus, by sanctioning APAC's monopoly, it would ensure that the source, gathering, and dissemination of information would come from Israel. Terra Incognita is an in-depth analysis of Israel's policy towards pro-Israel advocacy from its inception. The dearth on academic research on the subject lies, in fact, 
partly because most research has either been initiated or sponsored by diaspora organizations with their respective and vested interests in accentuating their respective contributions and that since much of the literature is written by those with little working knowledge of Hebrew, vital Hebrew documents are ignored. It is inconceivable that specialist scholars researching on another country would not have at least a working knowledge of the language. Furthermore, culling materials from archives is laborious and it is so much easier just to rely on secondary sources. Israel's leaders' ambivalence towards the diaspora notwithstanding, they sought to garner diaspora organizations' economic, political and diplomatic support. While Israel's declaration of independence appealed, quote, to the Jewish people throughout the diaspora to rally around the Jews of Eretz Israel in the task of immigration upholding and to stand by them in the great struggle for the realization of the age-old dream. By the way, one of the advantages of being a researcher in an archive is to actually look at the all the previous um, various formulations of what was going to go into the declaration of the state. And it was only a day and a half before that they took out calling on the Jews to make Aliyah. So we have this. On the other hand, this is contradicted by Ben Gurion, who maintained, quote, we have always to consider the interests of diaspora jury. But there is one crucial distinction, not what they think are their interests, but what we regard as their interests. In considering international relations, we must ask one simple question. What is good for Israel? And what is good for Israel is good for the entire Jewish people. And whatever is good for, the, for Israel falls within the scope of the injunction bequeathed to us by the victims of the Holocaust. Now, what is surprising in this research is I know of no other country in the world that had such a smooth transition from being a quasi semi-government such as the Jewish agency and the day after people taking up positions that didn't happen in virtually every country that the French, the Dutch, the British occupied. There was so much research in 1943-44 Ben Gurion sets up a commission to decide if the state will be created and if the mil when the million come, not if, what sort of a society we're going to have? How many high schools should we have? What should be in the menus of government offices? And yet there is no discussion whatsoever as to what the relationship will be between Israel's future or the Jewish state's future diplomats and the vast majority of the Jewish diaspora. No thought you won't find it in documents, and yet everything else is well thought. So in the absence of guidelines, Israelis, Israel's diplomatic missions pursued an ad, po ad hoc policy. Israel's relations with pro-Israel advocacy groups were extremely linked to its relations with fundraising groups, which I've written extensively, but I'm not going to go into here. The tension between Abe Iban uh, and UJ leader Henry Montour. By the way, Henry Montour's original name was Goldberg, so he decided to change his name to something to do with money, Mont. So he changed his name, of course, to Montour. Montour uh, held Ben uh, Eben in disdain and actually tried to have him removed as ambassador, telling, uh, telling Ben Gurion that Eben, Eben was not suited as ambassador and should be replaced by Golda Meir or Pinchas Levon. Now, in 1950, Monta lamented that the ZIOA numbered only 800,000 members. And he wanted to establish a new organization called the Friends of Israel that would bring all Jews together to serve, and the word serve Israel. He pleaded with the Zionist movement to permit and welcome and mobilize those men who want to help the state of Israel. Uh, for reasons which are immaterial at the moment, it has to replace. And he argues, this is 1950, I say that the Zionist organization of America today is a well of corruption. 
moral, political, and spiritual, to which no self-respecting Jew in America would attach himself. Why is it that the Zionist organization are trembling with rage? I think that the Zionist movement needs psychiatric treatment. It is frustrated. It is going through a psychological cli climactic. There are a large group of Jews who are the friends of Israel, whether you give them the title or not. And I address myself to the Zionist movement and ask the Zionist movement, are you prepared to stand in the way of rendering maximum service to Israel? Nachum Goldman, the president of the World Jewish Congress, who spoke seven languages, all of them in Yiddish, uh, retorted, you have today a Zionist organization which can be the most loyal servant of the government of Israel. Will the friends serve the government? Now, Monta received mixed messages from Israel's leaders and organizations. And this happens throughout the whole of the diaspora. On the one hand, it, um, the diaspora leaders are asked to intervene as trans, uh, transnational actors or Stadlanim, etc. And on the other hand, they're supposed to keep out. Um, in 1915, September 1950, the Israel government and the Jewish agency hosted a conference in Jerusalem. The Jerusalem conference, which again, I'm not going to go into a great deal. Now, although a great deal was in fact explained in the establishing of Israel bonds, which Gabby and I were at a conference in Brandeis, in which I gave a, a talk on Israel bonds and called it going back into bondage, um, the important thing, what was not explained there, was that the need to introduce a bill in the Congress to grant in aid to give to Israel. In fact, the, in order not to commit Israel to the Marshall Plan. Now, from a diplomatic point of view, the inauguration and management of the Israel state bonds campaign in the US placed Israel in an anomalous situation. Israel, were, Iban was Israel's representative in the US, but Montour refused to be subject to him. And there were more than 17 meetings, discussions in the Israeli cabinet to decide what to do with the Jewish diaspora leaders. 17 discussions took place between 1949 and 1960 and spent a great deal of time trying to work. Now, the important thing is that when we actually look at this, is that in 1952, Monta declared that we're going to have a Friends of Israel organization. And when Golda Meir came to address the bonds, they actually suggested that everyone going to this bonds meeting, they, they brought a bus and took them to another area of town, thinking that they were going to see Golda Meir, but they were going to see Henry Monta instead. Now, upon taking up his post as ambassador to Washington in 1950, of course, you, you pay for one and get one free. Uh, ambassador in the UN and uh, ambassador in Washington, US department officials complained to Abi Iban that they had received representations of as many as five separate Jewish organizations within five days in order to explain why they should support Israel. Iban bemoaned the fact that he, and this is according to his diary, he writes, he had separate communion with the Zionist Organization of America, Hadassah, Pioneer Women, B'nai B'rith, the Anti-Defamation League, the Orthodox Reform, Conservative Branches of Religious Jewry, and the leaders of UJM Bonds Organization. He writes in his diary, the exhaustion and repetitiveness of these occasions was increasingly burdensome. It was now becoming so laborious for me to go from one Jewish organization to another. So what does someone who has many relationships with a one put with many people, obviously they get married. Iban turned to the leader of exile, Nachum Goldman, to convene a conference of major Jewish organizations, the President's Club, to periodically consult with Iban and to exchange views and impressions. This was a major, major uh, impact on American Jewry, where the majority of these organizations were non-Zionist, but bringing in so many organizations, they became much more pro-Israel. Abraham Harman, a previous president of this university, head of the New York 
Israel Office of Information noted that during the issue of the American Jewish, the Zionist American Council had been responsible for mobilizing US public opinion and that, quote, it was a pity that this splendid instrument has been left to accumulate rust. The public relations field in this country is so vast that it can never be covered by the state's resources alone. And so therefore, what actually happened was that the creation of the Israel lobby was initiated by Israel's representatives. Now, of course, and I don't want to go into detail, APAC is a uniquely American organization funded by Americans, worked by Americans, but Israel initiated uh, the creation of APAC uh, or, or its predecessor, um, etc. Now, it quickly uh, became known that Israel, could o Israel was not being given uh, grants by the United States. In fact, there was a, 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 a discriminatory policy against Israel. Uh, already in 1949, part of the Marshall Plan and other plans was that, for instance, Iraq was receiving $50 million to, um, to actually absorb refugees, whereas in 1950, when Israel was asking that they should also be given as much money because Israel was absorbing uh, even more refugees, the um, State Department pressured uh, the uh, Eisenhower uh, administration not to grant any money whatsoever to Israel. So the only way that Israel could actually raise funds was to go straight to Congress. Isaiah Kanan, who worked as a Washington representative, um, lobbied hard to secure loans. Now, one of the interesting things in my research is even today, 25%, he was Canadian, 25% of all the leaders of all Jewish federations in North America, in the United States, sorry, come from Canada. They're Canadians. 25% Can of the leaders of Jewish federations originate, originated from Canada or Yordim, maybe. Um, uh, Keenan and the, and, the, and the offices, and this is something which I learned, from its very inception, their offices were bugged from the very day they operated and um, under continual FBI surveillance. Now, I am adherent to Oscar Wilde, who wrote that thieves respect property. They want the property to become theirs, they may fully respect it. And what better example than the British Museum, which has the largest collection of stolen property, and claims that in fact it actually, which is true, looks after the property much better than the Greeks and the Egyptians, and has the chutzpah to actually ask money for them to visit. Now why I mention this, not just in humour, was because I've had access to the transcripts. So I've had a access to transcripts which don't appear in APAC's archive, but I have asked, uh, um, I have, because of appeal to the CIA and, and uh, Freedom of Information Act, I've got, as I've got, um, I've got actually um, uh, transcripts of what went on in the offices. And this is what, not so dissimilar when, for instance, Ben-Gurion meets with Adenauer in the Wardoff Hotel in 1960, in which they weren't uh, protocols, and in the actual protocol which the CIA bugged and the FBI, uh, Adenauer asked, how many microphones do you think there are in this room? Uh, three or four, Ben Gurin says, I think there are many more, and they carry on. So there is an advantage sometimes when organizations are bugged illegally or legally that some stage or other we will get some sort of explanation. <laughs> now, one of the problems, of course, was the laws of lobbying. And that, again, I don't have time to go into. But the irony was that due to Jewish pressure in 1938, they passed a law in Congress, the 1938 Foreign Agents Act, which was aimed to limit the actions of pro-Nazi sympathizers in Germany. Now, one of the things is there are lobbying laws in which um, a lobby has to define itself with the Minister of Justice. In this connection, it's problematic because uh, in this case, there was a lobby which was set up entirely by Americans, entirely with American money, um, and was basically pressuring for a change in United States policy. Now, Eban's support of the um, 
the, the um, lobby was conditional on their avoidance of threats to individual senators and representatives. He advised them to look for the common factor in the American and Israeli legacies and to win their points by mutual sympathy, not by abrasive confrontation. Um, Iban did not feel that any Israel group should take a partisan interest in any candidacy. He felt that the organization should not be identified with Democrats or Republicans. And Iban confides in his diary, they and I also avoided the frequent word of lobby. The, this was because the word lobby was not a popular word in the United States, even though it is an accepted part of the democratic system. The idea of lobby implies an effort for a special interest to obtain more aid and consideration than those of which it is objectively entitled. The consequent atmosphere of incentives and pressures creates delicate situations which must be handled with care on the underlying assumption that those who operate them have a parallel and equal concern for American and Israeli interests and are not the uh, uh, uncritical standard bearers of every Israeli position, including those at variance with American consensus. And this basically is very much part of the whole conceptual framework of what is a transnational actor, with all those aspects. In 1957, the, uh, the lobby launched the Near East Report. Israel's embassy solicited pro-Israel articles, which were then distributed by other organizations. The distinguished Prince, uh, Princeton professor of international relations who worked with the, um, with the OSS and, and later on CIA, J.C. Horowitz, was a frequent writer who wrote under a different name and had received a retainer of $10,000 a year. The FBI alleged that it was financially dependent on the Jewish Agency of Israel. Now, Keenan um, maintained that the CIA had blundered in 1948 by maintaining its Zionist ideology, alienating potential supporters, and rude that it should have been the American Friends of Israel. In 1959, at Abe Iban's insistence, Israel was substituted for Zionist. So the American Zionist Public Affairs Committee was substituted for Israel, which therefore brought in organizations which were not Zionists, such as B'nai B'rith, and especially the American Jewish Committee. Another thing in which Abba Iban had um, uh, in, uh, very much uh, of a play was in 1958, in order, maybe the Gavalt complex, um, which we learned about before as well, is that part of the uh, 10th anniversary, you need a campaign and you need a disaster for a campaign. So a, uh, the AZPAC's um, slogan was, you must not let Israel be destroyed, Israel must not stand alone. Now the problem is with this logic, it's great for raising Jewish money, but the logic is if Israel's plight was so desperate and on the verge of collapse, it would be hard for Israel to convince the US that it could be a for formidable ally. And so all their slogans were changed. 1963, the Fulbright Senate Foreign Relations Committee, hearing on unregistered foreign agents, of which um, have gone through more than 17,000 pages of these transcripts, trying to prove that the AZAPC, which later became APAC, was in fact a foreign lobby trying to prove, and I think uh, and they did actually succeed, in trying to prove that the Jewish agency, which was in fact who actually sat on the Jewish agency, Ben Gurion in fact was chairman, and they also had Levi Eshkol who was representative, um, trying to explain that as long as the Jewish agency had connections with this organization, then it should be banned. The result was, in 1952, as we know, that there was a change of law, the Jewish agency law, in 1952. Now, most people think that law was brought about to try and work out better relations with the Jewish agency, but in fact, the law was passed to circumvent possible, possible prosecution of the FBI and the Ministry of Justice against the, the law. Now, not all pro 
Israel groups were welcomed. In 1955, Montour revived his idea to set up the American Friends of Israel, among others, Rudolf Sonnenbaum, and the AFI was adamant that Israel recognize its vast potential. Now here is an interesting thing, that instead of just setting up the organization, say we're an American organization, they wanted there to dat kashrut. Why they have to ask for it, I'm not, I'm not explaining. And in fact, what happened was that Ben Gurion, uh, there is tremendous opposition. Hadassah writes to um, complain that the, the, this new organization uh, should uh, not exist. They try to put pressure on Israel's leaders to put pressure on American Jews not to um, create this organization. Um, and in fact, um, everything was done to stop it. Now, there was a meeting on the 7th of, Ma of March, 1956, the most rancorous meeting that ever took place um, it, during Abi Iban's office, in which the, he met with leaders of the American Friends of Israel, and basically he explained that Israel was only going to recognize one organization, and that was the American Zionist public affairs, later on APAC, and that nothing would be done to jeopardize their great achievements. So here we, he, we, here we see, until today, and that would explain, in terms of J Street and the APAC as a, lo as a lobby, that Israel was insistent of recognizing APAC on the condition that APAC received all their information directly from Israel. Now, I don't in any way mean this as a criticism, because the success of APAC is not the fact that there are so, uh, their, their um, money, etc. The fact is the information that they render, since it's very, uh, it's very accurate, that they made sure from its very beginnings until today that all senators um, will receive information that is absolutely accurate. There's no good of saying, I gavolt every time if it doesn't work. And that, when it comes to making statements, so if the United States is allocating X amount of money on the basis of food for peace, or advocating money for refugees, the, the case was not that this is not fair, but how is it possible that Israel is discriminated against because it answers all the criterion which the Senate and the Congress, in fact, had set itself, and in fact, um, they weren't giving the money. Now, in terms of um, when we look after this organization uh, didn't uh, get off the ground, uh, but the, the, major, um, the major, I think, crisis comes in 1977. Because up to 1977, whatever happens, there are Labour-led governments. What happens in 1977, when Beijing comes to power, the expectation of the Israeli government is that APAC will, in fact, tow the government line. That, in fact, will explain Israel's policies. And this becomes a, a serious problem as to, to what to do. Whether the organisation is there to support uh, Israel's policies, or whether it's there to question, etc., etc. Now, in Rab another turning point is Rabin's election in 1992. This led to a widespread alienation of many of Israel's enthusiastic U.S. Jewish supporters. This was due to Rabin's attitude towards his Jewish supporters, and don't forget that Rabin had been ambassador in the United States, and the implications of his election perceived by his opponents, the actions of the Likud opposition in exporting Israeli political battles to the US shores. The result was, I have 600 seconds, 300 seconds, it's fine. Um, the result was the destruction of much of the conceptual framework by which US Jews and Israel had related to one another, and a wholesale rewriting and even discarding of the accepted boundaries of relations with them. Many attributed Rabin's victory to Israeli voter fears that Likud Prime Minister Shamir's intransigence would in fact provoke President Bush into cutting aid. In August, one of, his, one of Rabin's first meetings in Washington was with the AIPAC executive, which was long and very, very difficult. Now, in fact, what Rabin, in fact, tried to do was APAC was working against 
Oslo, was working against um, various problems with the settlements. And in fact, R uh, Rabin basically bypassed them and didn't attend uh, one of their uh, conference, one of their conferences. He allegedly told the executives, APAC executives, you've aroused too much antagonism, you make too many enemies for yourselves, and your record is poor. But he was back the next year uh, working with APAC. Now, one of the important things um, is that um, the idea of, and this is why I'm going to be summing up, and again, the historical roots here, the idea of what, in fact, is the purpose of the Israel lobby. Is it there to make sure that uh, government funding? Is it there to make sure that American policy um, strengthens Israel? Because a strong Israel, in theory, is, is helpful for the United States. But one of the things I wanted to show, but I'm not going to bore you here with figures, is that I analyzed American contributions from 1948 to 2011. Every single contribution that was made directly from Congress, whether it was allocated food for peace, by the way, all of us know that there was no American military aid to Israel until 1959 which uh, explodes the myth that Israel was totally dependent on the United States for its uh, military survival. But the interesting thing to note here is that the success of APAC, whatever people think, and I'm not here as, their, as its um, advocate, actually I wanted to go to the conference uh, recently um, because I'm doing research and I asked if I could go, but they said you have to pay a minimum of $5,000 and um, etc., cetera, which, which, which was unfortunate. But the interesting thing is if you actually look at the loans, all of them in fact were given at the very beginning as in fact um, loans. They were all changed to grants, but more importantly, the actual amount of money that the United States has given has not been has in fact not been proportionate to the reduction of American aid to other people. And this is why I'm finishing. In terms of J Street and other organizations which are reflective of certain attitudes of Israel, the Israel government will take into consideration one thing and one thing only. APAC has succeeded in maintaining consistent United States Congress support for Israel. And by all likeliness, JPAC, J Street, and its representatives have been unable to do so. And that will probably continue in the next few years. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Owe. How are we done for this uh, in-depth and uh, systematic uh, analysis? Uh, Professor Shane didn't show up, so I suggest that we move to the second part of this uh, panel. And I feel that uh, the, uh, Professor Sheffer's uh, paper uh, placed the Jewish uh, diaspora and uh, its uh, relations with uh, the homeland in a, a comparative uh, perspective to other uh, diasporas and thus uh, provided us with some uh, theoretical uh, insights. Uh, are we done on his uh, part, probably uh, as in, uh, because of uh, his background as an historian, uh, analyzed and uh, portrayed the uh, process of the uh, construction of uh, Jewish uh, lobbies and uh, the uh, policy of uh, Israeli uh, government toward uh, pro-Israeli uh, advocacy, uh, which uh, seems now with uh, J Street to uh, still be very uh, dynamic, and I would uh, assume, uh, given uh, Shane, uh, Shane's title, uh, that uh, if he would have uh, been here, his paper would probably be more uh, in line with uh, Sheffer's uh, uh, analysis. That's because it begins with S. Pardon same me? letter. His surname is the same. Same letter. Okay. Uh, directing attention to the change in uh, equilibrium between uh, the Jewish diaspora and Israel uh, regarding the uh, specific uh, uh, topic of uh, the Middle East uh, uh, conflict. Now I'd like to uh, perhaps uh, uh, make a few uh, comments or uh, waste a few uh, questions which uh, I hope we, uh, can lay uh, some of the foundations for, uh, for our discussion. And uh, Professor uh, Sheffield, uh, suggested that uh, 
Uh, diaspora uh, tried to uh, maintain a very uh, defined uh, boundaries. Uh, and I wonder how do you uh, refer uh, to the phenomena of uh, religious uh, mixing, which uh, is uh, reflected in the increasing rate of interfaith marriage among uh, many Jewish uh, diasporas, which now reaches uh, levels of 50 or even 70 uh, percent in major uh, Jewish communities in, uh, in the world. Uh, another uh, point is uh, that uh, Jewish uh, diasporas, uh, first and foremost in the United States, but also in other parts of the world, now uh, are, are comprising of a large numbers of, uh, of Israelis. And uh, the, uh, uh, the American, for example, uh, Jews and the Israeli uh, Americans uh, are very distinct and different uh, groups uh, in terms of their communal uh, organizations, in terms of their uh, relationships uh, to uh, Israel, the fact that Israeli, Israelis in the United States had the experience of living in Israel, uh, not to say that they have an Israeli citizenship and they speak the local language. And I uh, wonder uh, what, to what extent uh, a first generation of uh, immigrants have uh, an effect of a more veteran diaspora in the case of the Jewish diaspora and whether this is also uh, seen in other uh, uh, diasporas uh, uh, in the United States or in other places. Uh, you also mentioned uh, J Street and other uh, lobbies, uh, again, both in the United States and uh, in other uh, places. And I uh, would guess that uh, on the part of uh, the more ordinary Israeli uh, citizens, they would probably would like that uh, Jewish uh, in the diaspora would not uh, express uh, independent uh, stance uh, regarding domestic matters, especially regarding the Israeli-Arab uh, conflict. And uh, to what extent this uh, abundance of uh, lobbies uh, has the potential of uh, harming uh, the relationships between uh, world Jewry uh, and Israel. And if I try to uh, somehow uh, bridge or link between uh, the two uh, uh, speakers, between uh, Sheffer's presentation and uh, Awidian's presentations, I wonder to what uh, extent the uh, policy, the, uh, some quite uh, consistent policy of the Israeli uh, government that uh, Dr. Waridan uh, describes of the ambivalency toward the uh, Jewish uh, diaspora uh, and uh, perhaps somewhat tension uh, towards uh, Jewish uh, lobbies, uh, whether this is something which is unique uh, to the uh, Jewish diaspora or can be seen in uh, regard to the relationships between uh, other diasporas and their uh, homelands. So uh, these are some of the uh, points that I uh, picked during your uh, uh, presentations. I uh, invite some more questions, uh, and then we'll give uh, <coughs> Professor Sheffield and Dr. Waridan the opportunity to uh, to react and to answer. Yes, please. Thank you for the Thank you for these two uh, very interesting presentations. Um, I think there's a major conceptual problem with the use of the term diaspora when you talk about the Jewish diaspora in America or elsewhere. Because with all the other diasporas, the Greek, Italian, Japanese, and so on, you have the country of origin being the actual country uh, such as Italy, Greece, Japan, and so on. In the case of the American Jewish diaspora, I would say diaspora in quotation marks, you have uh, most of it coming from Russia and other places, not from Israel. In fact, until the creation of Israel and many years after that, the number of Jews in America and elsewhere were, was higher than the number of Jews in this country. And it's only recently, perhaps, that the numbers are more or less equal. So you have a problem with the use of diaspora. And even if you uh, 
ask most of the Jews in the US or, or elsewhere, are you a member of any kind of diaspora? I would think that most of them wouldn't say no. We're not in the diaspora. And the same is also true of the term exile, which is often used in this country. They would never say they're in exile. They feel very well wherever they are. And they've, many of them have no intention of immigrating to this country. So this is a methodological and conceptual problem. The same also with the use of the term Jewish people, which in this country is a matter of course. And we always speak of the Jewish people as if all the people, all the Jews in the world were one people. But if you uh, query the Jews in the US and elsewhere, they would not necessarily say that they're members of the Jewish people. In fact, most of them would say we're members of the American people, French people, and so on. So I would ask the uh, lecture, the speakers, to address this issue. Thank you very much. Uh, Ken Stein, Emory University. Um, let me preface this by saying, um, for the last uh, nine years, I've been a speaker at an APEC conference um, in Washington, that I've done about a dozen speeches for APEC around the country over the last five to seven years. Um, I'm reasonably familiar with their efforts and lobbying activities. I'm also a historian of um, modern Israel. Um, having said that, um, I think in the context of your presentation, um, and, and Gabi's too, but yours particularly to, to start with, um, I think it would be very helpful for us to understand what was the Ben-Gurion compromise with Blaustein in 1950. Maybe it's in your book and you just didn't have time to mention it, as, as, as things always happen in presentations like this. Um, and also the relationship between um, Epstein, Shertok, um, and the State Department uh, between 45 and 49, where the foreign relations documents of the United States are replete with um, blatant anti-Semitism, and these guys were working against that. Um, the, the second point um, I think is, is, is very relevant is that in understanding J Street, J Street is one of many organizations that have cropped up over time in the United States that have been either anti-Zionist or anti-Israeli or anti-Israeli policy, going back to the American Council for Judaism. And that has to be put into that, you know, where does APEC fit, where does Cy Kennan fit into this evolution? Again, you, you, may have, you may be doing this in your book and you just didn't have time um, to tell us. Uh, for source material, uh, whether I don't know whether you've used it or not, um, but the American Jewish Yearbook from 1944 <coughs> onwards has wonderful, wonderful discussions of American Jews and Zionism and written by some very, very smart people, including Nachum Goldman. I mean, some of the earliest and best things that he, he ever wrote. Um, APEC today, um, its strength is not so much in the White House. But that ebbs and flows according to who the prime minister is and who the president is. And um, I think probably more important for the United States, or for Israel's relationship with the United States, is its messaging, which comes through the newly formed organization over the last seven or eight years, Jennifer Laszlo's Mizrahi's The Israel Project. I mean, it is, it is really a question of how do you message um, Israel's, uh, Israel's case. Um, uh, I, I, was, I asked you to repeat the statement. You said 25% of heads of federation come from Canada. I'm stunned by that reality. Um, and I, I need to go back home and, 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 and check it out um, just to, to be absolutely sure. Um, the last point. Um, you're right. Um, the last point, which I think is um, just a matter of, of um, accuracy. I don't know anyone who has to pay $5,000 to go to an APEC conference. Um, it's $480, okay. uh, or 360. Um, if you want to be part of the Washington Club, the Capitol Club, the Senate Club, you pay 1800 3600 5400 and the Minion Club is $100,000. Um, and I think you have to go to an APEC conference and you have to go to some of their presentations around the country in order to get a real grasp of the, of the strength that they have. 
and it's really not with the White House over time. It's, it's stri it has to do with Congress. And, and watching their parlor meetings are just breathtaking because of the, the influence and the excitement that these people have for what they're doing. Whether it's right or wrong politically is not important, but it's their way of showing American Jewish power. Thank you very much. Just as a, as a complimentary uh, remark to what was said earlier about the conceptual um, understanding of uh, what is diaspora and what is uh, homeland, um, I think the use of uh, country of origin and, and diaspora in the case of Israel versus the American Jewry is problematic because, uh, first of all, uh, and, and this is not the same aspect that was mentioned earlier, uh, if you compare it to any other diaspora, um, the Israeli case is really exceptional because uh, uh, most of this diaspora existed long before the state of Israel came into being. But the main difference is that unlike India, China, Japan, or Italy, or Ireland, um, the, the homeland was not necessarily identified with a state, with a, an existing state, and, and hence the whole question of who am I as an American uh, Jew uh, 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 versus Israel and, and how I feel about, about being um, uh, an American or, or, or part of the American people or part of the, Amer the Israeli people, uh, I think has, has a lot to do with this. And from uh, uh, only uh, uh, you know, being in the States for a few years, uh, not, uh, not continuously, uh, I have a feeling that sometimes we give too much of, uh, of definitions uh, of collective identity to uh, 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 millions of people, most of whom are not organized, do not have any connection with Israel, never came to visit Israel, and their, their uh, uh, affinity or, or emotional uh, 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 attachment uh, is, is by far uh, um, remote from, from the, the, the descriptions that uh, uh, um, sound from, from these presentations. We'll take one more question over there, and then we'll give the speakers the opportunity to answer. Okay. Um, sorry that I missed uh, most of Gavi's paper, but I was just wondering at all, has any research or any connection been done in terms of the diaspora with organizations of the four, late 30s and 40s? I'm referring to the American Christian Association for Palestine and, of course, the Canadian Palestine Committee. Um, I have a few questions to Professor Gabi Sheffer. Um, is there any uh, distinction you could make between the European and the American diaspora in the Jewish context? Both in terms. No, 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 no. Jewish diaspora in the United States and Jewish diaspora in the or Israeli. Uh, in that sense, do you find both in terms of their political uh, usefulness or how far they're able to influence the policies of that? Second thing is, you know, now uh, so many diasporas are there, especially in the United States. So in some cases, the Jewish diaspora works in collaboration with others. And in some cases, there is a conflict of interest, for instance, Turkey in the last few years. How, do, how does these diasporas manage vis-a-vis -vis the host countries, the, the diversities within themselves uh, when it comes to the policy differences? Uh, and the last minor, probably a clarification. Uh, do you consider the Jewish population in Eastern Europe as a diaspora, in the Russian context at least? Thanks. OK, uh, I have a, long, a very long list of, um, of questions. Let me uh, try uh, to deal first. Let me try to deal first with the uh, question of uh, definition of uh, uh, of diaspora well uh, this uh, was debated for a long time you know 
uh, the uh, legitimacy to call these groups as, uh, as diaspora. Uh, but uh, now it is very, uh, very greatly accepted by uh, many people in, um, in the host countries and the homelands and so on and so, uh, so forth. You know, diaspora means dispersal. Uh, people, persons, uh, groups who are dispersed in many other, uh, in many other, in many other, in many uh, countries, okay? So um, uh, it, it is uh, now uh, very well accepted, and it is accepted not only by academics, it is accepted by uh, people in, in the diasporas, okay? Uh, a few years ago, uh, the, main, the only diaspora was the, the Jewish diaspora, but now most of these people are uh, accepting the, the notion of, uh, uh, of a diaspora. And uh, as I mentioned uh, before, now people are talking about American diaspora and American diaspora, namely Americans who live outside and the administration, let me tell you that the administration is establishing a, a special office to deal with the American, with the American quote unquote diaspora, to deal with them, to uh, you know, create the, the relations and uh, increase the relations and, and so on and so forth and direct them in certain directions and like, many other diaspora, and the Indian, you know that the Indian government has um, an office, you know, a department for dealing with the uh, diaspora. This is becoming a, a major, uh, major uh, uh, issue. Now, about uh, the Jewish people and so on and so forth, I, I mentioned, and you should have, um, uh, and uh, let, me re uh, let me repeat it, each of these diasporas is heterogeneous. It's a heterogeneous uh, uh, um, community or whatever you want, okay? Now, I make a distinction between assimilated diaspora, assimilated diaspora, namely those who think, you know, uh, have been uh, changed even their religion, but nevertheless they think that they grand-grandfather was Jewish and they have certain connection to uh, Jewishness and so on and so forth. These are the assimilated uh, people. Secondly, you have integrated diasporas and there are degrees of integration. You have full integration into their country of uh, residence, okay? And, and, uh, and uh, the, the, there are degrees, as I said, you know, between the, the various uh, types of in integration. And you have uh, people who are fully integrated into their countries of origin and they identify with the country of origin, but nevertheless, stronger, in a stronger way than the assimilated, the diaspora, they feel some connection to the, uh, to the diaspora. And then you have the core of the diaspora. These are people who regard themselves as members of uh, the diaspora, and they have a connection with uh, what is regarded as the homeland, as the country of, uh, of origin of the, entire, of the entire diaspora. And this applies, you know, to the Russian Jews, and this applies to the Russian Jews that uh, emigrated to the uh, United States. They have connections, of course, with uh, Russia or with the Soviet Union, but uh, uh, if they are core people, if they are strongly connected and they have uh, the identity and they keep the identity, uh, they will um, uh, be part of, uh, uh, part of the diaspora. I didn't want to go into uh, the great details about the, the, uh, what holds the diaspora uh, all together, but I mentioned a number of things. I did mention ge uh, the genetic aspect, and we have many studies about the genetics, and most of the diaspora, most of the diaspora, most of the core of uh, people of the diaspora are <coughs> genetically connected uh, to the ethno-national, religious, general, uh, general entity. Let me, uh, I didn't tell you stories in my presentation, but let me tell you one story, you know, about uh, uh, 12 years ago or something like this, I, I went to Berlin and I was talking about uh, the, these issues and I, me I mentioned in one word, you know, the genetical uh, aspect 
and they started, there were 300 people in the, in the, in the uh, place, and uh, they started to shout, go out of, of here, you know, you are a racist. But I went uh, again five years to the same kind of, uh, uh, and everybody said, Sheffer, tell us about the genetic uh, aspect. Because this is becoming a, a factor, <coughs> which is, uh, you know, very accepted now. It's not accept, uh, only accepted by the academics, like myself, but it is accepted by the people themselves. There are genetic, you know, uh, connection between uh, most of these uh, uh, diaspora uh, uh, people, and they, uh, they are uh, part of the Jewish nation, the Jewish people. They are part of the Jewish nation, uh, the, the, uh, the Jewish uh, people. Now, uh, Uzi asked me about the boundaries of uh, the diaspora. The core people, you know, try to maintain the boundaries in order to prevent greater assimilation and greater integration and so on and so forth, to maintain the, co uh, the community. Sometimes they have, uh, you know, an ability to maintain the community and sometimes they don't have uh, a, an ability to, uh, to maintain the community. Now in, uh, in Europe, somebody asked me uh, about the, the, the um, differences and uh, similarities between the European and the American uh, Jewish uh, diaspora. Now the, uh, the people in Europe, core people uh, of uh, the Jewish diaspora in, in Europe think about how to maintain the boundaries of uh, the, the diaspora. And where is the center of the nation? Is it uh, Israel or is it uh, the diaspora, the, the European diaspora? But the same efforts are going. There are certain uh, Jewish communities uh, in Europe, for instance, the British community, which is uh, uh, becoming less uh, united and less uh, but uh, there are uh, some communities which are, are very strong. For instance, the, uh, uh, the relatively uh, uh, renewed community in, in uh, Germany is, a very strong, is becoming a very strong community, and they try to keep the, uh, the boundaries of, uh, uh, the, boundaries of uh, the, the community and to, uh, to uh, maintain the, uh, the ideas, and then the same applies to the American Jewish uh, com community. M I mean, you know, by the uh, boundaries is to maintain a communal, kind of a communal uh, identity, communal uh, uh, participation, communal uh, membership in the organization, communal uh, activities, and so on and so forth. That's what I mean by uh, the, uh, maintaining the borders, and as I said um, uh, two minutes ago, um, preventing as, as much as possible you know, the assimilation and the full integration of these people into their uh, host, uh, uh, host, uh, host land. Uh, we have a problem, I, I don't want to, I, I just hinted that, we have a debate among the people who are dealing with the diaspora uh, about the um, transnational, uh, definition of uh, this uh, and the ethno-national religious diaspora. I, I hinted at it. I said I think the transnational, uh, the transnational entities are those who are like the Catholics, like the communists in the past. These uh, who are some of them uh, have emigrated and some of them live in, in the, the country, in the country of origin, and so on and so forth. This is an open debate. Uh, the transnationalist uh, group of scholars realizes now, and some of the leading uh, who invented, quote unquote, the, the idea of transnationalism realize now that diasporism is a, a phenomenon which is, uh, has different aspects from the uh, transnationalist uh, uh, attitude, and they have written about it and uh, accepted uh, the, um, uh, the, the idea. Now, uh, I, I have a lot of uh, more to say, but I don't want to, to continue. I want to let uh, Nathan uh, talk. Um, only one, one comment about J Street and the similar. You know that uh, there are many similar organizations in Europe and in Canada. In Canada, you have uh, quite, uh, quite a few, quite a number of uh, 
uh, J Street. They are not all, uh, uh, they are not calling them uh, uh, J Street. Let me emphasize that uh, I, I mentioned the reform uh, movement and the conservative movement uh, and J Street. J Street is not against Israel. It's not against Israel. They like Israel and they visit here and so on and so forth. We must make a distinction. They are against the policies of the Israeli government. They are against the policies of the Israeli government. And this is a very important factor uh, in this uh, kind of, uh, uh, of uh, relationship. Um, let, me, let's, let me stop here. Thank you very much. I often find that the question and answer session is more actually important than the actual lecture itself. And I think that the comments raised were very helpful. Um, in terms of concept of diaspora, if one actually looks at the first use of the word diaspora, it was around 1881. And the interesting, powerful word of diaspora is not just to spread. The word die in Greek is to be cut off. The word spora is meaning spread out and growing again. So the word diaspora is very powerful because what actually happens here is that Jewish people are cut off from their ancient homeland and they continue writing the Babylonian Talmud. Jewish law continues to flourish. So this word of diaspora, I think, is important. And quite interestingly enough, when Gabi wrote an article for Israel Studies, and the question is whether you write diaspora with a capital D or not, but until about 10 years ago, whenever you used to write the word diaspora, describing Palestinian diaspora, Greek diaspora, you always wrote it with a small d. When you talk about the Jewish diaspora, it's always written with a capital D. Well, it's changed. I, mean, I, said, I said it's changed, but uh, for at least 30, 30 to 40 years. And the reason in my theory is that having diaspora with a capital D, capital D, of course, it's not the name of a place, it's not the name of an organization, but it's a legitimation of a place. Now, when we actually look in terms of how we describe diaspora, it could be world jewelry, Jews, uh, peoplehood, etc. But the interesting thing is that when we actually look at the word exile and the word galut on diaspora, it's in many ways very prejudicial. We never talk about the Moroccan diaspora. We never talk about the Ethiopian diaspora. So basically, when we write about diaspora, it's mainly to do with Europeans living in semi-democracies. Whenever have we talked about the Ethiopian diaspora, the Moroccan diaspora, the Algerian diaspora, it's always galut. It's always galut, and that's how it was referred to. Now, when we actually look at the word diaspora and galut, there's an interesting explanation here, because when the Jews were able to rebuild the Second Temple, only 42,000 returned with Nehemiah and Ezra with their 7,000 slaves. And hundreds of thousands continued to cry and weep for Zion, but they didn't come back. So was in fact in uh, Babylon, was it in fact a Jewish diaspora or was it in fact exile? It's something I'm throwing out because if they were in exile, they could also come back. Now, um, in terms of um, Uzi's explanation about, and I think it's important to the ambivalence and unique to compare to other countries, of course, um, I think that Gabi has contributed a great deal by showing that the Jewish diaspora is not necessarily unique, but we're unique in being unique. And some examples. When in the Declaration of the State of Israel we call upon Jews to help, it's not calling upon expatriates to help. It's not talking about Indian nationals, Pakistani nationals living in Britain or, or elsewhere. It's calling upon people by ethnicity, by religion, to support a state in which 99% have never been there, not even first, second, third, or fourth, or fifth generation. That makes it unique. Also unique. But the same applies to the Indian diaspora and the well, Chinese diaspora. Well, um, not necessarily, but we can talk yeah. about that later on. The other thing is, and that's the issue of criticism. And that is a number of documents which I find that you have an example of criticism of Charette, a, a Jewish religious academic on his way 
from Auckland writes to Walter Eitan, the Director General of the Foreign Minister, complaining that the man next to him had bacon and eggs for breakfast. The man next to him happened to be Charette. Now, what makes this unique? Of course, if the Indian, not there isn't an Indian ambassador in Britain, it's a high commissioner. But let's say you had the Indian high commissioner being seen eating beef. Okay, that would be an insult, and if he was a Hindu, for instance. But there are dozens and dozens of examples of local Jews complaining about the food that they see Israeli diplomats. But not just that. Having, they demand to have a say on who is going to be appointed ambassador. Now, that doesn't happen with the Indian um, ethnic community or any other communities. I'm talking about documents just literally maybe 30 or 40, and if someone wants, I can send them to you. But we, have, we want to have a say about who is going to be the next Israeli ambassador or charge d'affaires. That makes it unique. But of course, there are other things. In terms of Ken Stein and your points are very helpful, of course, the Ben-Gurion agreement. It, in, in Hebrew, it's called Heskem. It, wasn't, it was an understanding. And it was held on the 23rd of August 1950 at 4 o'clock in the afternoon in the King David Hotel. And interestingly enough, it was a week before the Jerusalem conference because Blaustein refused to attend. In fact, it was a conference for Jewish business people. But Blaustein was very careful about the idea of Zionism and non-Zionism. And this was a conceptual framework which still is important today because the most important part of that understanding is that Blaustein tells Ben-Gurion, do not think that if things get, you know, the, still today, if things get very bad, you know, where are your insurance policy? He tells Ben-Gurion in unquivocal tones, which is absolutely imperative today, if, if things are so bad economically in America, do you think they're going to be better in Israel? In the light, in the shadow of the third, or maybe an oncoming third world war, if things are so bad, the security of American Jews, do you honestly think that it'll be safer for Israel? In terms of the um, conference, I, I don't normally misrepresent things, but maybe the secretary got a naught mixed up in, in, the, in the funds. But I very much would like to go there, and I think that the organization has done very well, and I follow uh, what you do um, for, for APAC. Again, I'm not convinced that J Street is anti-Zionist in the sense that there are Israelis who are very critical of Israeli policies, let's say in the West Bank, but wouldn't consider themselves to be anti-Zionist. Um, in terms of um, Canadians, there has been work written, not enough, um, and I'll be very happy to help you with that. And I'm going to finish now with, again, a unique example of how APAC worked. We, know, we understand of Israel's complicated relations with Turkey. Now, Turkey gave APAC uh, more than a million dollars in support over a number of years because also the belief that we understand that many countries believe that Israel um, has the ear of the White House, but it's true. I mean, when it comes to F F-16s, the Israeli Air Force uh, were working and um, on F-16s in Turkey. But the interesting thing here is that you have a unique example that when finally the Anti-Defamation League of the United States calls a spade a spade and calls the Armenian genocide a genocide, you have the Turkish authorities trying to pressurize Tsipi Livni, then foreign minister, to, cap, to clamp down and censure and stop the Anti-Defamation League in its policies towards um, the Armenian genocide. And when it wasn't done, then the money was cut off. And that's, that's a unique example of other things as well. One last point, two years ago, I was invited to meet with the uh, South Korean ambassador. Of course, it's not South Korea, it's Republic of Korea. And I didn't know why I was being asked to go to Herzliya Pituach, being sent a taxi, um, because I was considered to be an expert on Israel diaspora relations. I finally realized that I was told that the secretary looked me up on the internet, etc., etc. But when I went there, the, the ambassador tried to tax me, how powerful is the Jewish lobby? To what extent do they control America? And I basically tried to convince him that, yes, uh, the, the lobby is powerful because it's in the interest of the United States. But then he cut short and said, that's it. He gave me some lovely tea. Uh, and I later discovered he became ambassador to the United States. I disappointed him with his policy. 
let me add, let me add one sentence, one sentence. Uh, I was asked about uh, the Israelis in, I was asked about the Israelis in the diaspora. My personal view is that you have two diasporas. You have the Israeli diaspora and you have the Jewish, the Jewish diaspora. I'm not uh, just to, to, you know, to be provocative and to let you think there are two diasporas. There were attempts, for instance, in Los Angeles to create a common, you know, a common community. It didn't work. It didn't work mainly because of the Israelis rather than the Jews. OK, well, we're a bit uh, past the time. Uh, quick comment, yeah. um, please. As far as the Israeli diaspora, there are, of course, more Israelis today living outside the state of Israel that were living in Israel when the state was created. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Which is an incredible statistic when you think about it. Right. But knowing that the 250,000 in Miami, the 250,000 at least in LA, and probably an equal number in New York, I don't know who's written about those close to 800,000. No. But it's a fascinating to watch these people get together for meetings, collaborate right. privately, mm -hmm. right. not in some sort of organized fashion, and the American Jewish community, organized Jewish community itself, is frustrated as can be because it can't incorporate Israelis into the operation right. of the JCCs, right. except right. when they will have an Israeli cultural event. And the other question is whether they should be given the right to vote as other expatriates in well, other countries. No here, no yeah. But uh, okay. you know, there are some writing about it, including uh, Uzi Rebun's yeah, writing about the Israelis. And there are some other writers who, yeah, you should look okay, for Okay, I'm it. sure that we'll have some uh, more time to discuss these topics over uh, lunch. I'd like to uh, once again thank Professor Sheffer and Dr. Wawidan, and we shall uh, resume at 2 o'clock here in this room. Thank you.